I know there's a lot of things going on in this world that can be uh, so disturbing and unsettling, but there is one thing that we can stand on that is sure 100% of the time, and that is his promises. Amen? Let's sing. Standing on his promises through Christ my King. favorites when the roll is called up yonder. How about you? Oh, introduce myself? Oh, someone is asking. I'm Susan Castor <laughs> from town in Jamestown. a beautiful choir and what a choir that will be when the roll is called up yonder. Amen. We're going to sing our theme song now. Sweet, sweet spirit. 
Again, we'll sing it twice through and how about we do like we did last night? We'll sing it peaceful, softly the first time and then build with enthusiasm as we go. Thank you, Susan and Leanne. If you had a beautiful Sabbath, some sweet, a few sweet hours left. We'll enjoy them, yes? Um, before we get started, I have prayer. I have a few announcements just so that you know. Uh, there's, there's going to be a campfire in the center of our wood stocks out there. And I'm checking with Dan. There's a possibility there's hay rides, but I haven't got confirmation on that. But as um, soon as we know, we'll let you know. The Camp Cherokee Snack Shop will be open after Sabbath, obviously, and also the food store will be open. And tomorrow at one o'clock in front of the girls' dorm under the trees, there's a watermelon feed. So, uh, so please come and join us. Um, let's bow our heads for prayer and invite the Lord's presence again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the privilege of being your children and the fellowship that we've had. Um, the blessing, the refreshment, the rest that we've been able to experience. I ask that you would bless each person that's here, each family that's represented. Those of us, there's parts, people in our families uh, that are struggling, they're wrestling. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to touch their hearts and minds, remind them of how much you love them. Draw us together as a complete family, a full family. Lord, I ask that your spirit would be present tonight and everything that's done and said in this place that would glorify your name. Um, just open our hearts and our minds to be avenues for your love and your spirit to flow through us. And we just thank you again for the privilege of being your children and being invited into your house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath and good evening. It's good to, to see you here worshiping God. 
Um, we're changing some things up this camp meeting. As you've noticed, we had our Pathfinders present this morning for uh, our opening of, of church service. Uh, we're also changing some other things. We want to highlight our Pathfinders because uh, our Pathfinders are precious to us. Amen? Uh, we had an excellent camporee this spring, and it was great to be around to some uh, uh, investitures for adventurers and pathfinders this year. And it's exciting always to see the accomplishments the pathfinders have made. As you see the pathfinders with their honors and their insignia uh, that they have earned this year, uh, it represents a year of spiritual growth. And uh, we have those participating tonight. Several have not only been invested in their class and their advanced class, but also Pathfinder of the Year. And to get a Pathfinder Year, you have to do your class, advanced class, uh, earn six honors, do a project, and write a resume. And so we have Ginger Wells, Carson Wells, Reagan Hayes, Elijah Bonet, and Sertha Yu who uh, finished the, their Pathfinder of the Year. And every Pathfinder can be a Pathfinder of the Year. That's why we're excited about their involvement in ministry. Um, also, we have one that's here tonight. We have others that, that have completed this. There is an advanced award for, that is teen only. And it's unique to New York Conference in its name. There are other conferences that have teens awards, but ours is called a Teen Trailblazer. And on the pin, uh, and I invite you to take a look at it. Um, it is a, a trail to the cross. That's what we want for our Pathfinders, to go to the cross. And so Sir Thayu is representing tonight those who are part of the Teen Trailblazer Award. And what's that? Oh, Caleb made it too. And Caleb also uh, received his Pathfinder of the Year and Teen Trailblazer Award. So we want to celebrate what these young people have accomplished this year and we're thankful for them and we wanted to highlight that and so that's why we decided to make some changes and as we talked with administration uh, we wanted to highlight our pathfinders on sabbath sunday it's kind of hard um, with some of the pathfinders not here and so forth and so in changing up we also requested a difference in the tagging and so tonight's offering is designated for Pathfinder ministry. It will go to help our path, local Pathfinder clubs as well as a conference ministry for Pathfinders. And so there will not be tagging in the morning. And so you don't have to worry about us knocking on your door at eight o'clock in the morning uh, to see if we can get a dollar and receive a tag. So the offering tonight is for our Pathfinder ministry and again, congratulate our Pathfinders and the accomplishments that they've made this year because it does represent a year of spiritual growth for them. And we just want to celebrate our youth. So I'm going to ask the Pathfinders to come forward at this time. Um, the uh, Ithaca Pathfinders will be having our offertory music and we will be having pictures of our some of our Pathfinder year uh, as, as the offering is being taken. Uh, Pathfinder ministry is alive and well. We participated in the uh, Pathfinder Bible experience in Kingsbury, represented New York Conference at the union level, and we're excited that our Pathfinders get in the Word of God every year and participate in Pathfinder Bible experience. So uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we are very thankful for our young people and for Pathfinder ministry uh, specifically. We're thankful for the representation of Pathfinders from across the conference that are taking up the offering this evening. And we ask your blessing on this offering as Pathfinders uh, prepare for Gillette, Wyoming, as well as ministry at the local church level. And we pray for each Pathfinder. Lord, they're so precious to us, but even more so to you, because Jesus died for each one of these young people. So Lord, as we embrace them and encourage them in their spiritual walk with you, we just thank you for them and pray for the funds that are given that they will cover the expenses needed to do this ministry. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, greetings and blessings once again. Greetings and blessings once again. <laughs> Nice cool evening, so we're thankful for that. We have, uh, you know, this is the time where I would come up once again and introduce our speaker, but we already know who, who, who she is, correct? Dr. Talbot is the director of Jesus 101, that's right. And so we wanted to take this time, instead of kind of just introducing her again, is to, I have a question for you, Dr. Talbot, and that is, um, there are folks who are not necessarily aware of everything Jesus 101 does. You told me about some of the things that can help a local church who is interested in doing evangelism using some of the same uh, principles that you've been kind of sharing with us yes. uh, last night and today. So could you kind of share sure, with us? Sure, sure. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, we have tools for the local church. And being that today we talked about the Goel this morning, we created a five-day short evangelistic series for you to play in your churches. It's called Indestructible Love. And it's from Genesis to Revelation, the whole plan of salvation, either in five nights or five weekends, you play it in your own calendar. And we send you the five videos. Um, and it's a really fast pace. It's a dialogue between the director of Faith for Today and myself on the topic of the Goel. I want to show you a video that has a sample of what these videos look like, how fast they are. They are only half an hour. Um, and aside from that, uh, Pacific Press partnered with us, and they created a special edition of Science of the Times that have the five lessons in them. Jesus 101 gives you the whole series for free and 100 of these signs for free to each church that registers in indestructiblelove.org. And I'm hoping you will do it because this is a tool for your church for evangelism. So let's watch the, the video just for a second so you can see what the style is of the dialogue. So let's do that. We need audio. One, one, we are excited to be together in mission with the rest of our NAD family. We have partnered with Faith for Today to create a five session multimedia interactive evangelistic video series. It shows God from the perspective of a parent who lost his children to a deceiver and was willing to die to get them back. This is the dialogue style. We have had many different distorted images of God. And the truth is, the image that the Bible gives us is God as a parent. When you open up scripture and just let it speak for itself, you get a picture of indestructible love. Did you ever lose your kids for a couple of minutes? Are you kidding? No way. My wife would never <laughs> let me watch those boys. I have two boys. <laughs> She would never let me watch them again. You are finally with me. We're never going to depart again. We're forever together. I can't wait for that day when there is a new earth and there's no more pain and no more suffering. But even more than that, I can't wait for the embrace of Christ. For all of you that are like, I'm so afraid. I don't know what's going to happen. If you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, he says, today you can have the assurance that you will be with me. That's beautiful. In addition, we have partnered with Pacific Press to print 50,000 special issues of Science of the Times for Indestructible Love that contain the five lessons that accompany the five videos. For the Hispanic community of the NAD territory, we are so excited to announce that the 2022 Spanish Missionary Book of the Year, uh, published by Pacific Press, was produced by Jesus 101. It is entitled Confianza para Viaje de la Vida, Trust for Life's Journey, and it's about how to face anxiety with faith in God. We are very excited to be able to minister to both the English and the Spanish communities. And here at Jesus 101, we are committed to continue preaching the gospel together in mission. So this is the um, Pacific Press printed 50,000 of these. They already sold out. So what we did with Jesus 101, we bought a bunch so that the churches that want to register we can give them for free a hundred of these when they play these five videos. So that's the first tool I wanted to show them, which I told you for your pastors, right? But I want to tell you a little more about what we do uh, so that you can use it in your church. Um, so let's go to the slides. And uh, I'm just going to show a little bit of what other tools we have for the local church. Is that good? Absolutely. Okay. So. Uh, Many of you asked me today uh, about evangelism with the Goel, and that I'm, I'm showing you a tool, right? Um, 
Let's see if we have the, the slide. Do we have the slides? Okay. And aside from that, we create books, and these books are... Uh, this, is, this is the way that the registration Thank you. That the registration looks like. So those are the. This is this one thing that you just saw. This tool. This is where you register for it, and we send you the videos, and you play them in your own schedule. So next one uh, is this. This is the Indestructible Love Signs of the Times that has the five lessons in it, Can and you we give send us you. The website again. What's the website for that? Yeah, indestructiblelove.org. But if you go to Jesus101.tv, you will find it there too, because it's a ministry that Jesus101 puts together. So uh, it's called indestructiblelove.org. But if you go to Jesus101.tv, you will find it there too. Mm -hmm. All right. So. That's the science that I told you about. This is the book I told you this morning that explains the Goel. This is a great introductory book to explain the Gospels to someone. It's Surprised by Love, um, The Unexpected Rescue of God's Children. It explains the whole Goel concept, and uh, I also recorded it on audio, so you have it for free on the app or the website. All my books are uh, Pacific Press at the ABC. I only write for Pacific Press. So everything is at the ABC. But if you like digital, all my books are in Amazon too. So this is a great book to start somebody on the topic of salvation. Now the next book is The Goel with the Sabbath. And many of you came to ask me about it. It's called I Will Give You Rest, The Eternal Gospel for the Weary Soul. And it talks about the Sabbath. It introduces people to the Sabbath in light of the cross and the Goel concept. Now next is a whole series of Bible studies based on the Goel, preparing somebody for baptism based on the whole story of redemption based on the Goel. It's called Amazing Grace. It has 10 Bible studies in it. Now, aside from this topic, we have many books for your church to create small groups for studying. These are some of them. Radical Discipleship is on the disciples. The Exodus Journey is the whole uh, Exodus book. Uh, on our way to the Promised Land, we make a parallelism. Uh, the third one is After God's Heart is a study in brokenness from the life of David. These are just some of the books, and each chapter of the book has a video that goes with it. So these are for you to study with your congregation. And many churches are using them, and I'm hoping you will use them too. So this is the book um, for next year. So this is the sharing book for next year for the North American Division, and I wrote it. It's called The Battle Belongs to the Lord. It's 12 battles in the Bible, and what we can learn for that in our own battles, in our daily battles. Now, uh, as I told you, each chapter has a video. For example, the Exodus journey, I did it with Ty Gibson. Some of you watched it on Hope Channel, but we give you these videos to study with your congregation, each chapter of the book. So let's go to the next one. Uh, you have all of our TV series on our website and our app, so you can play them anytime you want. And we also have sermons for all those pastors that have multi-churches. We send you sermons that you can play when you cannot be in one of your churches. All right. Now, this is a really cool part that we have. As you know, we do biblical studies, and this is for kids. So we have many, many videos of one minute and 30 seconds that you can play for the children's story or in any other event for kids. I was so happy this morning. I found some families that told me that they're using in their church all of our videos for kids. So you have the videos, but check this out. Not only do you have the videos, but next please, we give you the PDF of the coloring page after they watch the video so they can color um, the same video that, that they have just watched. So you can use this for children's story and during the sermon they can color. And the next slide shows that we also have created activity sheets with the same topic. So you have the video, the PDF, and the activity sheets. Aside from that, we create illustration videos to explain the doctrines in light of the cross. The one you see there is the commandments, the Sabbath, prayer, baptism, etc. And we create these three-minute videos to explain our doctrines in light of the cross. So there is a lot, a lot, a lot on our website. So I'm, I'm hoping that you will take advantage. These are downloadable videos. You can play them anytime, jesus101.tv. So take advantage of this resource. It's a resource from the North American Division for you.
Thank, thank you, Dr. Talbot. How many of you believe that there would be people either in your family or in your community that could benefit from some of the things you've been hearing today and last night? So, so I encourage you, check out Jesus101.tv, check out the website and the things that are available for our, your churches. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I thought it would be good if we start this evening understanding what the word gospel means. So, most people don't know that the word gospel in Greek, euangelion, was used before Paul and the gospel writers chose this word for the good news of Jesus. This was a word that was used for, a, a, it had its own context before we know it as the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And this is the context, you're gonna love this. When the kings went out of the city to fight, as you know, the kings at that time were kings of small cities usually, and they were fortified cities. So they, went, they would go out, they would go out to fight outside the city. And all the inhabitants of the city were waiting in the wall to see if this, it was good news or bad news from the battlefield. And messengers would come yelling a particular word. If it was bad news, they would yell a particular word. If it was good news, 
they would yell the word euangelion, which is the word that is translated in our Bibles, gospel, good news. So this was the context. It meant good news, our king has won. That's what it meant. When Paul and the gospel writers are looking for a word to explain the good news of Jesus, they choose this word in Greek, euangelion, which is actually a cry from the battlefield that says our king has won. Now, I want to show you a slide. How is it that we end up with the word gospel in English? Because it sounds like it's not, you know, it's not the same word, but it is. So I want to show you what it is. So the word in, in uh, Greek is euangelion. That's how you spell it. In Spanish, it's exactly the same word, evangelio. This is where we get the word evangelists, right? So it's made out of two words, euangelion. U means good in Greek, angelion means message or news. This is where we get the word angel for messenger, right? U angelion, good news. And it used to be, in the old English, used to be God spell for good news. It used to be God spell. And then the English language contracted and we ended up with gospel. But originally, it was God spell for good news. All right, so this is where the word comes from. Now, I want to show you a verse in the Old Testament that shows us this context of the word, that it was actually uh, a cry of victory that came from the battlefield. That's why the people that came from the battle were called evangelists because they were coming to say, our king has won. So turn with me to Isaiah 52, 7. I want to show you this word, euangelion, in this context, twice in one verse in the Old Testament. So this is Isaiah 52, 7. You guys know this, this verse by heart, but I wanted to show it to you now that you know what the word gospel means. Those of you that read um, the devotional, Jesus Wins, in 2020, that's why we put that title, because that's really what the word gospel means. Our king has won. So um, let's go to Isaiah 52, 7. And as I, as I explained this morning, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated to Greek 200 years before Jesus was born. And this was the main, the main Bible that the New Testament writers quoted from when they were quote in the Old Testament. So look at it, Isaiah 52, 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings, and the Greek says, euangelion. How beautiful, why are they beautiful, the feet of those who come with good news? Because they are bringing news of victory, our king has won. So it says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings euangelion, says the Greek, who announces peace and brings euangelion, again, same word, of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So when you are uh, saying, we got to preach the gospel to all nations, Remember that the gospel is a cry of victory that our king has won. Don't forget this, because a lot of people say that they're preaching the gospel, but they're not. Evangelion is, not, is, is good news, not good advice. It's, it's the victory cry that our king has already won. Okay, so what does the Holy Spirit come to our lives for? Well, first of all, he's the one that explains the euangelion to us. But what else does he come from? So before we go there, then I wanna finish this part with a video that is called the gospel. And it's gonna tell you how even the Greeks used to send messengers that were called evangelists to announce that Greece had won their battles. Well, now you understand why we call it the gospel, because our king has won the battle at the cross. So we're going to watch the video, and then we're going to start the main topic for this evening. The word gospel translates to news that brings joy. But this isn't just any news. 
A gospel is news that changes a life forever. After being invaded and enslaved by Persia, Greece won two decisive battles at Marathon and Solus. The Greeks sent out heralds, also called evangelists, to proclaim the good news to the cities. We have fought for you, we have won, and now you're no longer slaves, you're free. The reality is that we are all slaves, slaves to sin and slaves to death. We are slaves in need of good news. Enter Jesus, God's Son, fully God, fully man, bringing news that would change our lives forever. His news was this, I am the divine, come to you to do what you could not do for yourself. I will take what you deserve so you can have what I deserve. You have no idea how much it will cost me, but you also cannot imagine the depths of my love for you. It is a gift that I give freely, so repent. Repent from all the ways you've run from me and follow me. Follow me because I am the only way to eternal life. Follow me because I'm the savior you've been looking for. Follow me because I have authority over everything, yet I have humbled myself for you. Follow me because I died on a cross for you, because I'm your true love and your true life. This is my good news for you. This is my gospel that you have been saved by grace and that you are slaves no more. So this is what the word gospel means. So imagine the inhabitants of the city waiting for news from the battle. They didn't know if they would be slaves of the new king or if they were free because their king had won. And that's the word that Paul and the gospel writers chose to say, our king has won at the cross, and so you're free. All right, so now that you understand this, the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals to us the gospel, because Jesus obviously lived 2,000 years ago. We don't understand a lot of the things he did, so the Holy Spirit comes to reveal it to us through the word of God. What else does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? Well, let's go to the book of Ephesians, and then I'm going to use my props for the rest of the evening. So Ephesians chapter 2 explains, I, I'm just giving you some chapters that you can read later on at home to see what we are studying about. Very known verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. By grace you have been saved. Unfortunately, some translations say it in present tense. By grace you are saved, but that's not what the Greek says. The Greek original has a past tense. By grace you have been saved. You already are saved when you believe in Jesus. And you grasp this through faith. You are saved by grace, you grasp it through faith, and even well, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even the save to understand the grace is also a gift from God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And then we get another verse. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Interesting that that first, Paul wants to make sure you understand how you're saved. And this evening, this is going to be represented with the red robe. The red robe will represent how you are saved. And then he says, when you understand this, by faith, which is a gift of God, then God has prepared beforehand something for you to walk in it. And the Holy Spirit comes to empower you to walk in the purpose that God has for your life. This purpose is not meritorious for salvation. This purpose is for you to live for the glory of God and bring people to his kingdom. So we live our calling out of gratitude, not out of fear. Are we, are we clear on that? So we don't leave our calling in order to gain heaven. We live our calling because we already have heaven. So we do it 
with a woohoo in our hearts. We do it out of gratitude. We do it with joy. We do it with thanksgiving. We don't do it with fear because we are not gaining our salvation through our, our calling. We are living for the glory of God and to bring people to his kingdom. And so right after he explains this, then he goes to explain the role of the Spirit in this building of our calling. Verse 19, same chapter, chapter of Ephesians 2, verse 19 now. Then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are now fellow citizens with the saints, and you are now of God's household. We spent the whole morning trying to explain that you are now children of God. You already are in God's household when you accept the gospel. And then, verse 20, having, built, having, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And a lot of people tell me, see, we got to grow. Yeah, we grow because the Holy Spirit starts sanctifying our lives for his glory and for us to be able to do our purpose, but not to add merits to why we are saved. And so verse 22 says, in whom we are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes and explains the gospel to us. You say, okay, I accept this gospel. I'm saved through Jesus Christ. And God says, wonderful. I have these this good works that I have prepared beforehand for you to walk in them for my glory. Now that you understand the gospel, now you're safe to give you power to do your calling because you're never going to think that you're gaining heaven. Do you understand the difference? Because you have a calling. I have a calling. And the Spirit is the one who empowers us for this calling. He will give everything we need for us to fulfill the purpose for the calling that we have from God. But that is not for us to merit salvation. It's for us to live for his glory. Okay, so now that we are clear, <laughs> I'm going to go to the topic for tonight. When you accept the gospel, and this will be symbolized by this robe, you get some guarantees that come with the gospel. They're not the gospel. The gospel stands by itself 2,000 years ago. is the good news that Jesus has won the victory. When you accept this, you get some over, other things that come with it. You get the guarantee of his presence with you at all times. You get the guarantee of his provision for you at all times. And you get the guarantee that his purpose is being achieved in your life. Those are guarantees that come with the gospel. They're not the gospel, but they're the, the benefits of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit brings those into your life. He brings the presence of God with, at all times. There's not one moment. I gotta tell you, some of you have prayed for my husband. I almost lost, lost my husband this year. And I know many of you know about it and your churches were praying for it. Um, he got COVID at the beginning of the year, but something strange happened when he was in the hospital. Um, his neurological system shut down. And all of a sudden, one day, he stopped talking, stopped walking, stopped chewing, stopped swallowing, and he was dying. And I would go home every day because they allowed me to get into the room with him uh, every day. Uh, he was isolated, and I would go home every day, and I would fill my mind with this sentence, God is with us, and he's working his purposes in us. I didn't know the outcome. I didn't know if my husband would live or die because we don't, we're not given those those outcomes in this life. But we have certain guarantees that you can always know. And it's that God is with you, that he's providing what you need, and that his purposes are being achieved. And that's all I knew. So every day I would go home and for two hours I would watch sermons that reminded me that God was with me and his purposes were being achieved, whether he lived or died. And I knew, 
I knew that he, his eternal destiny was already <laughs> assured because he believes in the gospel. So even if he died, I knew he had eternal life when Jesus came. So uh, God decided to do a miracle. I call it a resurrection miracle because my husband was a lot more dead than alive. And God did restore him. And he regained everything that he had lost through COVID. And I praise God for that. But I know that not all the stories end this way. That's why the guarantee that you have is not the way that it will end in this world. The guarantee that you have is that God is with you and that his purposes will be achieved in your life. Okay, so I was looking to see which biography in the, in, in the Bible I could use to show you how God empowers us for our calling through his spirit. And because we have been studying the life of Joseph, I chose the life of Joseph. So go to Genesis 37. Now, I know that in the New Testament, every believer receives the Spirit when they believe in the Gospel. In the Old Testament, some people receive the Spirit to achieve a purpose for God, and Joseph was one of those people, as we are gonna see. But what I wanna show you here is that when you are a Christian and you have the Spirit, you will go through all kinds of things it's not that it's only gonna be good. You are gonna go through trials. You are gonna go through sickness. You are going to go through things that God allows in our lives to prepare us for our calling and to get intimacy with him. So these things are going to be um, visualized by these different stages, these different robes. And the robe that saves us is gonna be this one. So this is the way we're going to study this. And you will find out something really interesting. You're gonna find this fascinating. We're gonna do a narrative analysis of the story of Joseph. And you will find that the story of Joseph has two plots. One is given to you by the robes that he's wearing, and he wears three different robes in his lifetime. We, are, we know the colored one, the multicolored one, but this is not the only one. This is the first one he will wear. So we are told that, that he changes stages, and each stage has a new robe in the story of Joseph. But there's a second plot and it's the fact that God is orchestrating the life of Joseph behind the scenes. So each robe has two dreams attached to it. So there's two plots and there is six dreams. Two dreams per robe. So you will need your Bible and I'm hoping today that the Holy Spirit will not only inspire you but we'll give you peace about some of the things you're going through that you don't understand why. So let's go to Genesis 37. Joseph has been chosen for a purpose. It's a great purpose. He's gonna save an, a nation, the nation through which the Messiah is to come. But he doesn't know that because only God knows the plan for our lives and he doesn't tell. So Genesis 37 starts with the first robe. I call this the robe of your calling. All of us have a calling, and we have that calling from our mother's womb. You know, I was born in Argentina where I never seen a woman minister before. When I was three years old, instead of playing with my dolls, I would line them up and preach to them. I had never seen a woman preach. And I, I didn't know, I, I didn't pursue this career. I was in the business world for 15 years before I was called by the denomination to, to teach theology. So I have to tell you, there's something from your mother's womb that you have, and it doesn't matter your age, because sometimes we leave our calling for a few years to get our kids through college and all of that, and we re-grab our calling when we retire. Look at Moses, at 80 years old, he's doing his calling. So, chapter 37 starts with a dysfunctional family. Chapter 37, verse three, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. 
His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. If you're gonna wait for your family to be functional before you do your calling, you're gonna wait your whole life because there's not one family in the Bible that is not dysfunctional. Not even Jesus' family, because they kept trying to talk him out of his calling. We are human beings, and we are dysfunctional. And in our dysfunctionality, God calls us to preach the gospel. Why didn't he give it to the angels to preach? Because the angels are not human like us. We are the ones that are broken, and we become wounded healers, and out of our brokenness, we minister to people. So here is a very dysfunctional family. He gets a, a multicolored <laughs> tunic, and in the middle of that, the two dreams come. Because God, through the Spirit of God, is actually orchestrating Joseph's life, but he doesn't understand it. In this first robe, you won't understand what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. You will know that you're called, but you don't know what it is. And it's okay because you don't have to figure it out. God is the one orchestrating your life and your calling. I have, so many people come and say, I know God wants me to do something, but I don't know what it is. Wait, God reveals to you, he's orchestrating your life. And so the two dreams come. Verse six, he said to them, please listen to this dream which I've had. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gather around and bow down to my sheaf. See, he still does not have the gift to interpret dreams yet. It's not been given to him yet, so he doesn't have a clue what the dreams mean. Everybody else in his family seems to have it because they're gonna interpret it for him. Verse eight, his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Verse eight, continue, are you really going to rule over us? Oh yes, he is, but we don't know that yet. And so the second dream comes about the moon and the stars and all of that. Now, check this out. His brothers went to Shechem. And I tell you, study the Bible with a map because you will find very interesting things. His, his brothers moved to Shechem and, and he goes to Shechem and they have moved to Dothan. It's all very, very close. And they will sell him into slavery in Dothan. What I wanna tell you is that, did you know that the very land where Joseph was sold into slavery he ends up owning in, in an inheritance at the end of Genesis. The very place where they sell him will become his own property at the end of Genesis. Uh, remember John 4, the Samaritan woman in Sikar? Sikar and Shechem and Dothan are all in the same area. And remember the Samaritan woman said, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave this wealth to his son Joseph? Well, that whole area, I tell you, your life is a full circle, but you don't understand it in this side of eternity. Sometimes it will be revealed to you, but in heaven you'll see why God allowed certain things in your life. And Joseph will be sold into slavery, but check this out. He came, you know the story, verse 23, he, he came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and I'm gonna ask you to underline verse 31. Chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 31. They took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. That verse, underline it. They bring this to, to Jacob and the deceiver is now deceived by his children. Because whatever currency you use at home, your children will use with you. You yell, they will yell. You deceive, they will deceive. You lie, they will lie. This is a confusing time in our lives. But don't forget that the Holy Spirit is orchestrating Joseph's lives behind the scene. Yes, he got stripped from the first tunic, but it's not that God has lost control. God never loses control. If you have given your life to Jesus, the Spirit will do the purpose of God in your life. And so, 
we get a verse at the end that shows us that he's closer and closer to the dream that God had for him, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't understand it. Look at all the details that we're given. Verse 36, meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. You're given all these details. That is not that he was sold to anybody. He was sold to Potiphar, who happened to be Pharaoh's officer, who happened to be the captain of the bodyguard. Now, let me tell you this. I wish that in our lives we could go from the robe of our calling to the robe of the fulfillment of our calling without going to the middle robe. I would love to tell you that, but I can't. Because every person that did their calling in the Bible had to, had to go through a desert of the soul, a wilderness. This is the robe of our training, and it's always a robe of suffering. It's when you will, you will go the longest journey from your head to your heart. This is when you will be stripped of all your securities. This is whatever you trusted in, you're gonna lose in this robe. Whether that was your profession, or your money, or your or relationships, or whatever it may be, God will leave you in a place where the only person you can trust is God. And you will find that God is enough. For me, it was my divorce from my first husband. You know, I, I was, um, and by the way, we go through this many times in our lives, three or four times. You know, I was born in the Adventist church. I was a pastor's kid. Then my father became the president of the union. They, then he became the director of the white estate for the general conference. So I was one of those people that knew everything. I thought. I was a Pharisee. I would tell you everything you were doing wrong. I would tell you why you had to do everything. And then I lost my first marriage of 15 years. And I had to leave that marriage. This is not the right place to discuss it, why I had to, but it wasn't safe for me anymore. And I had to leave it, and that was the moment in which I met a God of my very own. I was at the bottom. I was getting letters from all over the world because I was a public person and people love to talk about things that they don't know anything about. And so I was receiving all these letters and things about what I should do and they had no idea the things that were happening. Now I can talk about it. I've been married to my second husband for 22 years. And when I married him, he had three daughters, so I have three stepdaughters and nine grandchildren. And if you told me that I would have this life of preaching the gospel all over the world, if you told me this 25 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. But God has a way to orchestrate our lives and do the purpose that he had for us from our mother's womb. That's why I told you this morning, I like it if you like me. But if you don't like me, you can't ruin my day because I have gone, you know, at that time, and that's why I'm so passionate about us opening the doors for people that are suffering. At that time, I didn't find a lot of help inside the church, even though I was a youth leader. I was a volunteer pastor at the time, many, many years ago, 25 years ago. And I went to all kinds of programs that helped me. And I, and I heard a statement that I never forgot. Religiosity, you know what religiosity is? Religiosity is a religion that is filled with rules, regulations, and has no joy, and it's all, you can't come in like this, and you can't, like that. That's called religiosity. The statement said, religiosity is for those who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for those who have already been there. <laughs> Isn't that deep? I think that's very deep. Because if you go through something that, that for you feels like hell, that's when you find a real God whose love is greater than your failures. And then nobody can take you away from that. 
because your masks come off and I can tell you about it. And if you judge me, it's your problem. You know what I mean? Because I found the gospel during this time. Preach it, sister, woo-hoo. So what happens is this time will train you to trust in God with all you have. And for you, it might be a sickness, or it might be a divorce, or it might be your kids that left the church, or it might be, I don't know what it is, an addiction, I don't know. But what I do know is that God will give you the great blessing of coming to a place where you can no longer trust in yourself for anything. And so we become wounded healers, and then we minister from a different place inside of us. And so Joseph will go through this. I always call it the cocoon, where the caterpillar dies and the butterfly is born. Did you ever think about the fact that the cocoon is both the tomb and the womb? Isn't that interesting? That one place can be the tomb and the womb? Well, many of us will go through things like this. And if you didn't know why God allowed it, now you know. It's because God allows things in this suffering world that will get us closer and closer to him and that will bring him glory because through it all, God is orchestrating the purpose for your life. And so, chapter 39, we get into this stage in the life of Joseph. Verse two, underline it. The Lord was with Joseph. Yeah, but he's a slave now. Yes, but the Lord is with Joseph. (laughs) If you thought that because you're going through hardship, it means that God left you, don't believe that lie. Moses went through it, David went through it, Elijah went through it, Abraham went through it. Every person that did something significant for God went through a wilderness. And so the Lord, we are told right there, chapter 39, uh, chapter 38 is about something else, is about Judah, and the, the, the Joseph story is picked up in 39. Verse two, the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and we are told again. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. It was so evident that the Spirit of God was with Joseph that everybody he encountered realized this. Yeah, but he's a slave. Yeah, but he's a slave within the purpose of God. And so everything he did It says that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. And verse 44, uh, uh, verse 4, I'm in Genesis 39, verse 4, Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house. From now on, every job that he has is overseer because he's being prepared to, to be the overseer in Egypt, but he couldn't imagine that. He's gonna be given, as you will see in a moment, the overseer garment that only Joseph wore. This identified him as the overseer. And Potiphar says, you are in charge of everything except my wife. And Potiphar's wife raises her hand and says, I wanna be included in the things that Joseph oversees. And Joseph, this, in this stage, your integrity will be tested. And even when you do the right thing, you will end up in jail. Because God is teaching you to trust only in him. And so, we are told in verse 11, I'm in Genesis 39, 11, it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there and she caught him by his garment, here you have your word, garment or robe or cloth, depending on your version, because the life of Joseph has three garments, each one symbolized in a stage, but for each one we have two dreams because God is orchestrating his life behind the scenes. And so she takes the garment that he's wearing 
saying, lie with me, verse 12. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called all the men. And it's interesting because she uses the garment of Joseph as exhibit A. And if you keep reading, the word garment is told many, many times in just a few verses. Verse 15, when he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. Poor Joseph, every time he gets a new robe, somebody strips it from him. <laughs> How many robes, Lord? How many robes until you can use me for your glory? Oh, it's because we are hard-headed and we trust in our own resources. The more intelligent you are, more resources you have, the hardest it is for God to crack that head. And God had to bring me through all kinds of things. And he's not done with me, but he has cracked something, and it's the fact that I have no answers other than the gospel at this time. See, something happens to you when you start losing your masks. And so, he goes to jail. And in jail, the two dreams come. Because every stage in Joseph's life will have two dreams because God is orchestrating his life. And it is in this stage that you will not only get your experience for your calling like the overseer, but this is the stage when you will receive spiritual gifts from the Spirit of God to do your calling. They don't come for you. They don't come for you to say, I'm so strong and so good. They come for you to be able to do your calling. And this is the first time that Joseph gets the spiritual gift of interpreting dreams in his story. And so you know the two dreams, the cupbearer and the baker. They have two dreams, and this is in chapter 40, verse 8. They said to him, we have had a dream and there's no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. I love this. He doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm such a good interpreter of dreams. He says the interpretations belong to God. So tell it to me, please. And if God wants to, he'll give me an answer for you. So they tell the dreams, you know this story. And the cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh and the baker is hung. And I love what he says to the cupbearer, verse 14. I am in Genesis 40, verse 14. Keep me in mind when it goes well with you, he says to the cupbearer. Because, because Joseph is not in denial, and I don't mean the river in Egypt, he's actually not in denial. Because it's not like you say as a Christian, oh, I love this jail. No, you, you don't say that. You say, I believe God is working his purposes in this jail. I believe the Spirit of God is with me in this jail. You don't say, oh, I love the jail. I know some people who do that, and it's so fake. Because who loves the jail? Who loves being sick? Who loves a divorce? Nobody loves it, but you keep believing that God is with you, that his provisions are with you, and that he's working his purposes in your life. So look at this, verse 14. Keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, for I was in fact, verse 15, kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. And you know what's interesting in the Hebrew? The word dungeon there is the word pit, which is the same word of the place where the brothers put him before they sold him to the Midianites. This is his second pit. It's his second robe and his second pit. How, how many pits, Lord? And this stage would be very sad. And you know, it's interesting. I'm not going to do it today. But if I did a survey, a silent survey in a paper, and I asked you, in which robe are you? 70% of you would tell me you're in the middle robe, not understanding why God is allowing something specific in your life. 
And this would be a very difficult stage. It is a very difficult stage, but it would be even more difficult if it wasn't for one verse. I need to tell you this verse. It's chapter 39, verse 20. Now check this out. You're going to love this. Genesis 39, verse 20. It says that when they put him in jail, they didn't put him in a regular jail. Verse 20. Joseph's master took him and put him in the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. This was the royal jail. It wasn't a regular jail. Why did Potiphar, why did Potiphar have the legal right to put him on the royal jail? Why, what? Because Potiphar was the head of it, because Potiphar worked for the king. So when he put him in jail, he didn't put him in the regular jail, he put him in the royal jail. So when God planned Joseph's life and said, okay, his brothers are going to sell him, so somebody has to buy him, and I'm going to find somebody that works for Pharaoh so that when he goes to jail, he's not going to go to the regular jail, he's going to go to the royal jail where he's going to find the cupbearer who eventually will remember him and talk to Pharaoh about him. Every detail of your life is in God's control. And you didn't, know, didn't think that the check is in the mail, the one you need to pay your rent? God knows everything you need. Every detail of your life. And you're going to say, but you don't understand what my marriage is, is like is like a jail, and my church is like a jail, and my school is like a jail. And I'm going to tell you, <laughs> but it's the royal jail. It's the jail that God is allowing so that you can get closer and more intimate with him in your training stage. And then we get to chapter 41. And I hate the way it starts. Because it says, chapter 41, verse 1, it happened at the end of two full days, two full months. I will settle for two full months that the copper forgot Joseph. But two full years? And I have to tell you, God's clock has never, ever, ever matched my watch. Never. God's timing has never matched mine. I, uh, ask, ask Mary, who just got engaged with Joseph, and God said, this is the moment when you get, need to get, pre get pregnant. Couldn't we wait another year until we are actually married so people are not going to think that, no, now, because it's going to be a virgin birth. Yeah, but everybody's going to think... There is an author, her name is Beth Moore, that says, if you're ever struggling with God's timing, ask Sarah. <laughs> and she says, Sarah, Abraham's wife, became the first woman to pay the pediatrician with a social security check. <laughs> I think that's so funny. She waited all her life to have the child. And God had to wait? She was in her 90s? What's up, God? He was the first woman to pay the pediatrician with a social security check. I love it. God's timing will never match your timing because God's purposes are higher than our purposes. And so, at the end of two full years, Pharaoh had how many dreams? Two, because each stage in Joseph's life has one robe and two dreams. And so Pharaoh will have two dreams, nobody can interpret it, and the cupbearer remember after two years. Verse 12 of chapter 41, a Hebrew youth was with us, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard. We related them, the, the dreams, to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. Verse 13, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened, he restored me in my office, but he hanged him, and Pharaoh said, bring that boy, because it is in this part that God will make the connections that you need in this jail so that you can eventually do the fulfillment of your calling. And so Pharaoh said, bring that boy, and I, I love the details in the biblical narrative. It says that... Um, yes, that's what it says. Good, good. And it says... Um, 
Verse 14, Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, and this is the last temptation before he goes into his third robe, uh, is the temptation when you think that you're gifted and you start believing you're gifted. I, I work in media. I've seen a lot of people go bad because they start feeling like stars. You know, and, and God gives you gifts so that you can do what he purposed for you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 15, I have had a dream, no one can interpret it, and I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. You are great. And Joseph answered the way we are all to answer. He answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. It is in God. God decides when and if. I, and I have to confess something to you. <laughs> if there is somebody in your church that's been waiting 20 years to be first elder, that person is not ready to be first elder. If somebody wants to be the president of the conference and says, oh, I am so ready, and I didn't talk to Miguel, I'm sorry, Miguel, I, I hope you never said that, right? <laughs> so you're never ready for your calling. You're always looking behind you to see who God is talking to. He finds you stuttering the way that he found Moses stuttering when the calling came. And the, the, what I wanna confess to you is this. I speak all over the world. I never have believed that I'm a good speaker. I believe that the Holy Spirit comes and shows himself. And imagine if I believed that I'm a, a, a gifted speaker. Imagine if I believed that, well, I'm so good that I don't know why you people didn't invite me before. You know what I mean? What, what would you say if I believed that? God could not use me. And so every time I come here, and God is my witness, anytime I say to God, I have nothing to say unless your spirit shows up and says it. And you know what God told me in my spirit one time that I'm never gonna forget? <laughs> he said, I have used donkeys to speak for me before, and, and, and you are the donkey of the day. <laughs> So every time I come, I remember Balaam, that if God could use the donkey to speak for him, I'm going to be the donkey of the day. And I'm just going to open my mouth and God better talk. Because it's his thing. He does his thing. We are nev never believe, oh, I'm such a good singer. I'm such a good this. I'm such a good that. That I am just a gift to the world. No, it's not like that. God gives you spiritual gifts, and they're true gifts. And they are for you to do the purpose that he has planned for you. And so, Joseph says in verse 16 to answer to Pharaoh, it's not in me, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. He interprets the two dreams and gives a little advice to Pharaoh. And look what Pharaoh says. Verse 38. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Now he knows it's not Joseph. He knows the spirit of God is in this man. And he says, we're not going to find another man like this in, in whom the spirit of the gods live. It was so obvious that the Spirit of God was with Joseph. And then he said on verse 39, since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. Verse 42, then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. And Joseph became the overseer in Egypt to save the race of Israel through which the Messiah was to come. 
And if you keep reading, you will see that Joseph had a belief that we need to have when things ba bad things happen to us. Chapter 45 of Genesis. The brothers, when he disclosed himself, the brothers are afraid that now him in the fine linen garment overseer in Egypt, he's going to retaliate. And Joseph says, no, 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 you don't understand. You meant it for bad, but God orchestrated my life. And so verse, chapter 45, verse 5, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there's still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to pre preserve for you a remnant, big word for us, right? Preserve for you a remnant, a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And if you keep reading, he will say it many times, you meant it for bad, but God orchestrated it for good. Now, the Spirit of God is with every believer. First, he explains to us what the gospel is so that we don't live with fear or anxiety about the future. Then he empowers us to do his calling for his glory, not in order to earn our salvation, but in order to live for the glory of God and bring people to his kingdom. You know, the Joseph is what we call a typological character. It's a symbol of Christ. All the, all the main characters in redemption history are typological. They're symbols of Christ. Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Jacob, David, etc. But there's one thing I want to tell you, because we don't have time to go over all of this, is that we are told what robe Jesus will be wearing in the second coming and it's told to us with a sentence from the story of Joseph. So I have to take you there. Chapter 19, on verse 11, the coming of Christ is depicted with robes. Go there, Revelation 19, starts on verse 11. It's interesting because everybody in this scene is wearing white. Even the horse is white, the angels are white, the redeemed have been uh, wearing white robes from the verses before, everything is white, except one, and that's Christ. I'm gonna read on verse 11, chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Now go to verse 13. That phrase that I ask you to underline in Genesis 37, 31, it's here. He is clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Well, yeah, they dipped this tunic in blood to deceive, but Jesus will be wearing a tunic dipped in blood to remind us of the price he paid that we may be able to be with him. And so, how do we live this life of uncertainty in, a, in the robe of our calling when we don't understand it very well, in the, the robe of our training when we're suffering and we don't know why God is allowing this, or in the robe of our fulfillment where we get up every morning with a spring in our step because we are doing what we were meant to do? How do we live life when it's so confusing and this goes over and over, this cycle? Well, actually, it's quite simple. If you have believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have accepted his robe of righteousness that covers you, whether you are in the first robe or the second robe or the third robe, you are covered. Because the righteousness of Christ never leaves you, whether you're in, you're in your confusing stage, or whether you're in your suffering stage, or whether you're in the fulfillment stage, you're always covered. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ says, he made him who had no sin to become sin for us, that he may give us his righteousness and cover us. So may God bless you and keep you, because the Spirit of God dwells in the believers, and his presence, his provision, his purpose will be achieved in your life. 
to tell you this truth, this is Joseph's story, but it's also my story, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. God bless you. Dear family of New York Conference, we're on a journey, and I pray that we remain faithful until Jesus comes back for us. On the journey of the narrow road And those who've come before us line the way Cheering on the faithful Encouraging the weary Their lives a steering testament To God's sustaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses Let us run the race not only for the prize But as those who've gone before us Let us leave to those behind us The heritage of faithfulness Passed on through godly lives Oh may all who come behind us Find us faithful May the fire of our devotion Light their way May the footprints that we leave Lead them to believe the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us faithful after all our hopes and dreams have come and gone and our children see through all we've left May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road which must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. that we live, lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their
Well, if you have been encouraged, would you say amen? amen. I'd like to ask Dr. Talbot if she would uh, just come up one more time. We, um, we want to thank you for letting the Lord use you. Um, I, I walked away feeling after the message this morning that if this did not light your fire, your wood is wet. Um, I couldn't even sit through that last video. I started crying, so I had to leave. Um, we want to thank you, and we want to also offer a word of prayer, because you're going to be leaving us, and um, we want to pray for you individually in your walk with the Lord, but also the Jesus 101 ministry. When we came here last night in the introduction, I said to you that Dr. Talbot is known for saying that the gospel is like fire in her bones and she means it. Do you agree? Yes. And I believe she wants that same fire to burn in each and every one of us. So I'd like to ask if we could all stand and, and pray together. We want to pray for Dr. Talbot and her ministry and safe travels back. Are you going home or where are you headed up to? Headed home? All right. For a few days. For a few days. So let's, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our theme this week is come Holy Spirit. We don't need to say come Holy Spirit. We need to say thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. You've been here. You've touched hearts. Lord, we know that if anyone's heart has been touched, it's been you. You've used your servant to just remind us and teach us things out of your word to connect these dots. Lord, we pray a special blessing upon Dr. Talbot as she travels home for her and her individual walk with you, but also as she is leading this ministry, trying to create messages, materials, programs to be able to allow us to share these same messages with others. I pray that the fire that's been lit will not just burn here and then go out, but that we'll take it and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, find ways to share these truths with other people. Amen. That when they hear it, they will say, woohoo, I want Jesus in my life. Amen. I want the go well, I need the go well. Be with her, be with us as we continue this week. May your Holy Spirit stay and burn within each one of us. Amen. This is our prayer. We lift it up in the name of Jesus and all God's people. Please say amen. 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 God bless you. Good night. <laughs> we'll, see, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>